All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Publicly. This is the eighth day of March in the year of our Lord, 2023. And because he's the Lord, he hasn't allowed the uh, people in authority in this world to destroy us all in the last 24 hours. Yikes. Uh, I, I was in Strategic Air Command. I was at Minot Air Force Base with the B-52, Strategic Bombers, the Minuteman missiles. Uh, yeah, I had access to the command post and things like that. Mm, top secret cryptographic clearance, that kind of stuff. In other words, we, uh, part of my responsibility was the digital communication system, or, or my units, uh, to th that the orders to launch would go over it. One of the ways the orders went over it. Landlines via modem. Uh, <clears throat> of course, all the equipment was dated from like the mid-60s. <sighs> this was not the mid-60s. This was the mid-70s. And by then, microprocessors and everything else were widely available, and you could have replaced most of the stuff with a single chip. Nowadays, you could replace the entire thing with a single chip uh, with no problem at all. Now, uh, but thanks to the grace of God. See, God will not allow man to destroy himself. Uh, all, the world is all afraid of, of uh, one-use plastic bags, ending the planet. These people are so irrational. First of all, it's self-limited. Uh, there's only a finite supply of hydrocarbons, and they were all once in the atmosphere anyway. <laughs> uh, th wait a minute, this, this is crazy. This is, the whole thing is crazy. It's, it's, it's fear being drummed up by someone or something to, to keep us slaves. Uh, the scripture is very clear that that Satan uses the fear of death to control his subjects, his children, on regenerate humanity. You know, why, why do people spend huge portions of their income on things like health insurance that doesn't actually make you healthy at all? It's really sick insurance. When, when, the, when the actual benefits from that are very marginal. You could replace, go buy yourself a bicycle and ride it two or three times a week for, you know, a half an hour. Or go walk every day for a half an hour or four or five days a week. The benefits from doing that are pretty much free and far out, uh, outpace uh, modern medical science. And you won't be taking statins. You won't be taking insulin. You, unless you've got a you know genetic uh, or a, a, a disastrous uh, consequence from like diabetes type one, something like that. Uh, but in general, what we suffer from is lifestyle diseases. We sit on our ass too much, uh, which you couldn't do a century ago. No, you still just wasn't. Once upon a time. Of course, the world was not perfect. It was still full of sinful men, but uh, cities have always been an exceedingly unhealthy place to live throughout history, and they remain so. Uh, and the, the great advances in medical science, if you want to call that, are clean water, safe food, although we do our best to eliminate that, and... Uh, Food that's not contaminated, well, that, that eliminates processed foods. Read the label on some of that stuff you're putting in your mouth that pretends to be food. 
uh, which doesn't come from God. It doesn't grow on a tree. It doesn't grow on a plant. It doesn't have four hooves. Uh, so if it's not what God gave us to eat. So if it comes out of a factory and you couldn't make it in your kitchen uh, reasonably, don't eat it. Uh, so clean water, clean food, and proper sanitation, waste disposal. So you're not dumping your sewage into the water source that you're drinking out of. And get that really clean water is under that too. And you're not breeding populations of rats so much and everything else. Uh, yeah, in fact, I actually here, and I live, it's semi-country, you know. It's a, it's a little community that's not incorporated. Uh, and... We have, well, it's semi-rural. You know, it's not really modern suburban either. It dates back about 100 years. But I used to just burn my trash. And every once in a while we get enough and they have a spring cleanup day or something. We get rid of the, the, the non-burnable stuff. Or try to recycle it. They don't even take things like glass anymore. So it's not worth enough. Uh, but I, I eventually stopped that and started, uh, you know, it's fairly, fairly expensive to pay for garbage pickup. I think it's over $50 a month now. And we don't even fill the garbage can up usually. But we were get, I was getting problems with raccoons. Uh, we were getting animals being attracted to my compost pile. You know, you, everything from the kitchen that will biodegrade ends up in the garden, but it goes in a pile first, and, and animals were coming around scavenging out of that. So I realize there's ways to deal with that, but it's just like, no, this is causing... T and like raccoons, they got into my garage here and did a lot of damage. Those things, those things they get into your, your attic or something like that, those are tremendously destructive. They're cute, but they're tremendously destructive, at least when they're small, they're cute. But they are terribly destructive. Uh, so I, uh, no, no, we can't be feeding the wildlife around here. I had to run a big doe deer out of my backyard the other day before I put the dog out, or she would have gone crazy. It was a big female and was really close to the house, and it didn't really care that I was looking out the window, wrapped out in the window, and it finally decided to mosey on off. The shepherd would have made her mosey a lot faster, though. I didn't want to put her out until, you know, I didn't want to go nuts. She would have. She smelled it, but if she had seen it, it would have been something else. Uh, the deer would have gone fast. <laughs> anyway, back to the subject on hand, since I'm running out of things worth looking at on the Internet, even, even stretching that. Uh, I happened to, for some stupid reason, looked at James White again, a video he apparently did yesterday, entitled, the, What the Celebration of Perversity Tells Us. Tells us, not James White. Uh, us, as in Bible-believing Christians, that, that, get, that take the Bible f for what it says without having to read it through ten volumes of theology, that's why they have to write so many of those books, because the Bible doesn't agree with them. They have to argue into accepting falsehoods. And that includes so-called Bible believers, too, with dispensationalism. Really? It's not taught in the Bible. If the Bible doesn't teach something, you don't have to believe it. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. The Bible does not teach the authority of the Pope. Does it? It doesn't even mention him. Well, unless it's talking about Antichrist or Antichrists. Uh, they're generally in the plural. <clears throat> no, it's not there. It doesn't teach us to, to uh, submit ourselves to a, a vicar of Christ. It doesn't say Peter is the first Pope. Peter would have had an argument with that. Uh, it, see, all these things, if, if the Bible doesn't teach it, the, especially the New Testament, remember, we're, new co we're under the New Covenant, we're not under the Old Covenant, uh, which is why Luther shouldn't have had the Ten Commandments in, you know. But Luther's church, now Luther didn't believe in a biblical church. 
well, he originally toyed with the idea of a believer's church. But see, that's, this is state religion. Protestantism is state religion. It doesn't transplant well, uh, where it is not doesn't have the authority of the state behind it. So in state religion, the the church and the state are joined together uh, in one to one degree or another. And there's uh, the state official. That's why a lot of the persecution of Christians over the past two millennia have occurred, because by other so-called Christians, because they might have. Uh, on biblical grounds, differed with the official religion of the state, which makes it a political crime, say, not, not just a matter of biblical debate. It becomes to disagree with the king, uh, <clears throat> and a matter of religion is to disagree with the king, you know, so and that, that must not be tolerated. So, like, uh, why Baptists were, or people that began to practice, began to practice again adult baptism, uh, the so-called Anabaptist, which really means rebaptizer, because they had been baptized as infants, were put to death during the Reformation period by not only the Catholics, but also by the Lutherans and the Calvinists. Uh, everybody hated them because they believed the Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now somebody will tar. Well, those were the Munster Rebellion. No, it wasn't. Uh, no. No, see, there was... And Luther himself, who was suffered because of of uh, uh, the the emperor again you had the the catholic government relationship it was a little bit inverted compared to the protestant where the state is over the church uh, under rome you had the church essentially over the state uh, <clears throat> the way it happened to develop in the west not the east the emperor was the head in the east but uh, these were state religions, and dissent, religious dissent, was a political crime, and punished, even with death. I want to get rid of you. You were a traitor because you didn't subscribe to the king's confession, and Baptists from the beginning, English Baptists were persecuted, and, and Anabaptists were severely persecuted, even on to death, um, because of these, you know, it wasn't just Rome. It wasn't just Rome. It was Protestantism, too. And now uh, James White has become one of the big proponents of this stuff. Theonomy. Uh, imposing God's law over the nations is what theonomy is. Uh, it's a fairly, you know, it, it's it's come and gone, gone over the years. Uh, it, it tends to rear its head periodically in Calvinism. But fortunately, Calvinism is just a tiny sliver of a sliver of a sliver of a sect. So uh, theonomy is, you know, considered heretical by most Calvinists. Especially in America. See, what, what is left of Calvinism in Europe or Protestantism in general? State religions are utterly dead. All of them. The English church is dead, empty in England and Scotland. It's gone. Uh, the, uh, or the Scottish church, too, you know, they're, they're gone. They're dead. Um, the buildings are empty. They've been converted into bars or, or nightclubs or mosques or uh, Protestant Christianity, uh, state Protestant Christianity, everywhere is dead. Scandinavia is dead. I mean, and then they're, they, of course, they become, as uh, society in general and the government in general becomes uh, defenders of vice, the state church, of course, has to go along with that. There is no possibility of resistance 
So you end up with six elderly people in a big stone uh, mausoleum uh, listening to a rainbow-clad female pastorette. But it happens in the United States, too, doesn't it? Anyway, James White did a video yesterday. And after recommending you listen to a sermon by Jeff Durbin, that it's, I'm sure is extolling the law, that the law is holy and good and pure, but it condemns, it does not save, it kills, it does not give life, never has. But I want to, uh, I listened to a little bit of this message from James White, and I think it, James White is the most inconsistent person I know. And if you listen to James White over the years, and I've listened to him for many, many years, <clears throat> and he looks much older now, and scraggly, he looks like a homeless man. Actually, he does. Take a look. Doesn't he look like a homeless dude? If it wasn't for that sure microphone in front of his face, if you just took him out and put him up, up on an L.A. street background, what would you think? Okay, so anyway, uh, I listened. He, he gets into this section. He talks about what, what the celebration of perversity tells us. And I'd just like to point, since he is maybe the Internet's leading advocate of high Calvinism, distorted by some other things, it's just he's utterly inconsistent with his own theology. Again, we're talking about theology proper, the theology of God, what God is like. You know, you, if you want to find out the official Calvinist line on that, uh, Westminster Confession of Faith. Just look there. That would be the same as the London Baptist Second Confession of Faith. Should have stuck with the first. Uh, it was political. The second one was political. They're, they were conforming to the to Westminster. That's why it's almost identical. Uh, just alters it to make it acceptable to Bast Baptist views. But they're not. The God is not the God of the Bible. It's not. The God described there is the God of Aristotle and, and Augustine and Aquinas. The God of the pagan corrupted church, thoroughly corrupted. The idea of God, no, it's not, not good. It's actually impossible. Aristotle's God cannot be possibly the God of the Bible. And even, even issues like so-called open theism. I mean, you look at the Bible. What does the Bible say about, what does God say about himself in the scriptures? Go back to the beginning, uh, Romans, uh, Genesis. Uh, and God brought all the animals he created before uh, Adam to see what Adam would call them. Now, a Calvinist will not believe that. He'll twist it and say, well, that's just God mumbling. That's just God pretending he doesn't know what Adam will call them. But God says he wanted to see what Adam would name them. And whatever Adam called them, that's what they were. So you have a situation here where God doesn't know. If you take the Bible on its face value, which Calvinists can't do, and it's God didn't know what Adam would name them. Because Adam is not a, a deterministic machine, like a, a, a computer program. It's not deterministic. It's not put this information in and this answer will always come out given the input. That's not Adam. Adam was made in the image of God. He wasn't even fallen yet. And God didn't know what he'd do. Uh, or, or what he'd call the animals. And you've got the same situation. Another example is uh, where... God tests Abraham when he says, tells Abraham to offer his son Isaac, the son of God's promise, uh, on an altar. And at the very moment Adam is about, or uh, Abraham is about to slay his son, 
uh, the Lord stops him and says to Abraham, Now I know you fear me. I believe it's fear. Uh, the word he uses there, the translation is fear. But uh, So now notice Abraham truly does believe God. God says, Now I know. So God didn't know until the, it happened. Probably Abraham didn't know either. So there's, you see, you, God is not deterministic, neither is man. Uh, you, you, it's not a simple logical equation. That, that Calvinism is, is childish because it, simplifies things that tries to reduce man to a to a logical formula uh, and it tries to reduce God to a logical formula it doesn't work that way and this whole uh, the the Reformed Baptists have exploded over some of these issues and James White has found tried to find himself on the biblical side and he's been called out as a heretic because he does not accept uh, uh, Oh, well, I think the issue in that case is like the simplicity of God. But these, some of these so-called attributes of God, which come from Aristotle, um, there's a lot of things that if you don't, they have a degree of truth to them, but it has to be carefully qualified. And we shouldn't use Aristotle's language anyway, because it doesn't come from God. We should stick with the scripture and at least the Lutherans have enough sense to leave God as a mystery. <laughs> we just can't explain this. Yeah, that's true. Uh, when you try to explain everything, it doesn't mean you should just give up before you attempt to understand what God is, is saying. Uh, but uh, you, you have to start realizing that you cannot comprehend, totally understand God, or yourself even. <sighs> But when God says he wanted to find out what Adam would name the creatures, God wanted to find out what Adam would name them. Now, a Calvinist professor will say that's not true. Basically, they end up saying God was lying to, uh, to us when he said that. Speaking in baby tech. Why, why would he have to do that? Why could he not just tell us the truth? Because it's Calvinism, that's why. The core of Calvinism is, is uh, in the video I commented on the other day about James White and, and uh, attacking Andy Stanley for basically preaching the gospel, is that if you listen to that uh, video, I didn't necessarily look, well, look at the whole section, but James White seems to think election is the gospel. God's choice is the gospel. That's not good news for sinners at all, is it? Well, God didn't cho choose you, therefore he chose you to go to hell. He created you to send you to hell. See, the, the core of Calvinism, the God of Calvinism, is the exhaustive decree of all things in all details. Completely. Everything is decreed beforehand in exhaustive detail. Think about that. So God planned everything. Not just good things, but bad things too. And God causes it all irresistibly. Sin is irresistible because God decreed it. Adam ate of the fruit because God decreed it. The whole human race fell into sin because it was the will of God. Irresistibly decreed. That is Calvinism. Straightforward Calvinism. Now, they don't like to talk about that, but that's what it says. And once you come to understand that, then is the point to decide whether or not you want to follow Calvin or not. So let's listen to some of James White here. I just want to point out, James White can't be consistent with his own Calvinism. 
it is hard. Th this is where he starts talking about the celebration of perversity. I think I'm a little low on the audio there. Let me. Uh, where did my volume go? Bring it up here. Not today to go online and not see some astonishingly disgusting video pop up on your screen of a grown male dressed as a female uh, spreading his legs uh, and showing his genitals to babies, infants, and young people, young children. Called, calling themselves drag queens. True. When I was growing up, such things were not even imaginable. No. No, no, no. And... Uh, what the, the the issue is not so much the drag queen. I mean, there's always been perverts, but the fact that society embraces them now and protects them. A Joe Biden, the great pervert protector, he puts them in high office. Have you noticed? Really strange ones in high office. Don't tell me he's not Satan <laughs> or Satan sock puppet. At least he he is definitely a child of the devil. Thoroughly controlled. I mean, if you were Satan, who would you want to control? Most of all in the world. Would would it not be the president of the United States? Uh, it, it, that might move, move in the fear, near future because he'd want to be the center of power where all the influence is because Satan's not uh, all-powerful. His, his greatest tool is the lie. Well, think of where most lies come from nowadays. That's where Satan is thoroughly entrenched. Um, we used to call these people transvestites and things like this. Cross-dressers, whatever. Growing up, I never heard of such things. But then I'm a few years older than James White. And I was now, maybe in Phoenix, Arizona. I was thinking recently, as I saw one of these horrific videos, I was thinking 40 years ago, pretty much everybody in our entire culture would have agreed that someone who does something like that to a child minimally needs to be locked up and execution might be a really proper way of dealing with such behavior. Uh, such people tend to be executed in prison by the prisoners. Apparently, uh, even among the rogues, perverts are not, you know, people that do things to children don't have a long life expectancy in prison. Forty years later, we are supposed to celebrate this. We are supposed to think this is wonderful. And if you dare think there is anything unnatural about a grown man wearing fake breasts and, and a wig in a dress, spreading his legs in front of three-year-olds, you're a bigot. Okay, does anybody see an inconsistency in James White here? Excuse me, I should have had him on the screen there too, shouldn't I have? Oops, 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 wrong one, there. So you just heard what James White said. Now, James White believes in the eternal decree of all things in exhaustive detail, including sin, including sin and all its details, including every wicked act of human beings. Not just, you know, the Bible, God owns himself, says earthquakes, d disasters, things like that. He says, I do these things. But what man does, the evil of man, including the fall of Adam. In exhaustive detail, the God of Calvin and Calvinism, the God of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, uh, 
I don't know if there's a European confession that, that does that too, I imagine. It says that God decreed all these things. So God decreed the the drag queen pervert at the library educating little children. There's Yes, it's gone to the point that you can't even avoid it. Uh, drag queen baby shows for infants. Is, is there a limit to human perversity? I mean, a few years ago, you know, people thought that when the homosexuals got their marriage, that, okay, that's it, they got it, now now this is going to end. No, <laughs> they immediately, it immediately went beyond that, didn't it, to transgenderism. Which isn't just a homosexual thing at all. It's, it's beyond that. So it's, no. So, but how can James White sit here as a Calvinist, as a high Calvinist, believing in his doctrines of the eternal decree of all things, which is central, central to Calvinism. It's what makes Calvinism, Calvinism. Nobody else agrees with that, but that's, that's Calvinism. That's what makes it unique. How can he complain about the perversion when God ordained it in exhaustive detail for his own glory? See, the problem with that, if God ordains all things, if he ordains good and evil, then what is his difference? Isn't good and evil both God's will equally? Isn't people that go to hell just as much elect as people to go to heaven? Aren't they just as predestined to that as as? So, so it, basically the whole idea, it's just like in Hinduism, the idea of good and evil breaks down as a mere illusion. If God ordained it, it must be good because God is good. Well, that means good does not really mean anything anymore. So God ordains what he specifically condemns. See, this, this is, but here's James White griping, as he always does, about how bad the world is. But it's the world as God ordained it to be in his theology. Huh? Can't he see that? See, he is not the, the, the brightest star in he the heavens, that's for sure. Or the, 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 the best kid in the class, whatever you want to use. He's not, the, he's not as intelligent as he pretends to be. Because this is stupid. And of course, if, if he were to, his whole life would cave in if he were to actually realize this. So I think people have a protective blindness in their minds that causes them to avoid facing the contradictions of their worldview. Now, this isn't a biblical problem at all because this doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from Aristotle. So you mix pagan poison in Christianity and you get Calvinism. And, uh, not just Calvinism either. This is also a poison, Roman Catholicism and everything else. Uh, paganism was brought in by people that were like converted philosophers. You have, today you have people like... Uh, uh, let me say here, William Lane Craig, that, I mean, people freely mix philosophy and their own ideas with, with Christianity. And you, he, well, it's like, here's a book that Craig and uh, J.P. Moreland put out. It's sort of, I would say, a textbook. Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. not the Bible. That's the only foundation for a Christian worldview is the Bible, not William Lane Craig. But because they love the world and the things of the world, they mix it. Or they're not mature enough to realize the danger. They don't, they don't really believe in the sufficiency of Scripture either. 
you don't need to write a book. God's already given us one. Actually, 66. But the Roman Catholics have more books in their Bible. So do the King James. All you King James only us. You have to realize that back in the 1700s, your King James Bible was stripped of a bunch of different books from the Old Testament. I love the King James. Really, I do. I think it's, in many ways, it's still the best translation around. However, it's not the final word. <laughs> and it does have mistakes in it. There were errors in it. There were typographical errors that they fixed over the years, too. There's actually two different versions. I believe there's the Oxford King James, and then there's the, the Cambridge King James to this very day. The, the differences between them are minuscule. You almost need an electron microscope to see them, but... Anyway, but the, the inconsistency here of a person that holds to high Calvinism, the, the eternal decree of all things, which is central to Calvinism, look in the Confessions. Again, turn to the Westminster Confession of Faith. The London Baptist says the same thing. And, and see, look at the sections on God. Well, let, let's go there now, in fact, as long as I'm doing this. You know, you, you th I have the idea, like, so I did some videos on Calvinism like a couple years ago and pointed all this stuff out. And I realized, why should I do that again? It's, it's sort of, I, I guess maybe that's why I'm probably not a very good pastor. It's like, I preached on the gospel already. Why should I do it again? But there's nothing else to preach on. So it's the only thing worth talking about. But this is because this is a, an attack on the gospel. It's an attack on God, the character of God. As, as many point, people have pointed out, rightly so, that Calvinism actually slanders God's character. Because if God decrees all the evil in the world, then God is evil. I don't care what qualification you want to put on that. Uh, so where am I going to look here? I need, okay, I need Bible works. I've got Bible works up. Where is it? No, I don't. There it goes. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Backgrounds. Westminster Standards. Now I got to see if. Am I going to get this up on? Yeah, yeah, that's that shows up now. Okay, so uh, it starts with Chapter One, Westminster Confession of Faith. Now this is probably the most authoritative. Even uh, the European Calvinists who aren't. Uh, part of the English Reformed, generally recognize this as authoritative, too. Uh, even though they hold to the three forms of unity, which is basically uh, the, the uh, it's somewhat different, but this is like developed later and is a little more to the point. So it starts with the Holy Scriptures and goes on to God and the Holy Trinity, and then it goes on to... Uh, Chapter 3 here, I believe. Let me... Okay, let's let's look at uh, chapter 2 first, or what they call a chapter here. There is but only one living and true God. Amen. Now, see, you got to be careful because a lot of things, there'll be a lot of truth. It's like rat poison. It has a lot of food in it to attract the rats. And then a little bit of strychnine, a very, very, very small percent of strychnine, less than 0.1%. Less than one part in a, mil a thousand, so um, I think it's actually less than that. And that's enough to kill you. The same as with sa what Satan does, he mixes things together. Uses truth as a vehicle, to, uh, as a Trojan horse, to get you to swallow the poison. Uh, as a as a candy wrapper. Remember years ago uh, when they came out with oleo oleo, polio. Oleo was a different toxin. P polio oral vaccine, 
when I was a kid uh, in grade school. Uh, instead of giving you a shot, what they did is they put this oral vaccine on a sugar cube. And then, of course, you ate it. Oh, it's sugar. Good. Mm, yum, yum. Can we have some more? Uh, but that's that's what Satan does. He puts the, the, the toxic medicine, uh, the poison, on an apple, a poisoned apple. Does that sound familiar? Puts it in a, a, a something a, uh, cloak cloaks it in a wrapping of truth. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection. Let me point out that the word infinite and infinite just means not finite. In other words, not measurable. It doesn't mean it's not a measure of extent. It's a measure of Non-fight, non you can't measure it. A most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions. Now, this is controversy. This is not actually true at this point. Okay, God is without body, but God became man, truly man. God, the, the, the Lagos, became man. Yet he was God. So to say God is without body is like, okay, what did you just do to Christ? Parts or passions. Well, if these things were properly qualified, maybe. But uh, th this is what they call a divine simplicity. Uh, without uh, body parts or passions, but God is not simple. <laughs> we, we have a triunity. You know, look at the complex creedal formulations of the Trinity. They're very careful to, to say there's one God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one God, and they're also very careful to say the Father is, is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. The Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit. And the Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. But they're one God and can't be separated. So, I mean, they get into very awkward language at times trying to main, try to hold the revelation of Scripture. That's, but... You can't, if you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're distinct. They're not separate, but they're distinct. So to say without parts, well, it depends exactly how you qualify that. He's not made out of parts, but he has different, well, in the, uh, the English it says parts persons. In the Latin it says personas, which means masks, sort of, uh, which is a bad translation. The Greeks used the word subsistences. Under God there subsists these three things that in English we call persons. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are subsistences uh, in God. So, I don't know. This could get you into a lot of trouble here in this confession. Are you denying the individuality of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? See, you have to hold both to the unity and to the distinctions between them. The Lagos is not the Father. But he is the Creator. I mean, they don't work separately. But they're like functional distinctions. In, in, in human beings, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. They are distinct. Yes, three parts, not two. Not a body and soul, body, soul, and spirit. So the, some things are better left not on set. Uh, without, without passions. Now, Passions to the Greeks were external things that moved you to do something. 
You were driven by your by passions, winds of passions that blew you around. Well, <sighs> what they mean in this is that God is not affected or moved by anything outside of himself. So your prayers have no effect on God. Your problems have no effect on God. In fact, God can't even see you. God can't have a relationship with you. If you get into this deep enough, you'll find out that because God is God is entirely self-contained, hermetically self-sealed from everything else. God doesn't observe anything. That's why closed theism, they don't call it that, but the opposite of open theism is closed theism. In other words, God, God does not see, even though the Bible repeatedly makes clear God sees and God observes, and God responds. That's not the God of Calvinism. That's not the God of classical theism, of Aristotle or Augustine. Or Thomas Aquinas. The reason they do that is they can't allow anything to change in God. He's absolutely changeless, including his knowledge. So if God has to learn by observing, he can't be the God of Aristotle and Calvin. See, God can't take the animals to Adam that God can't do that and to, in order to find out what Adam would name them, because the only reason Adam names them anyway is because God decreed it. And the only thing God knows about Adam is his own decree. So God is, knows out of himself, his own eternal decree, <clears throat> exactly what's going on. So he doesn't really, he doesn't enter, there's nothing, God is not aware really of anything outside of himself. He doesn't have eyes. He doesn't have ears. He can't because he's not allowed to learn. See, this is human wisdom, nullifying the God of the Scripture, the God of, introducing the God uh, Calvin's or Aristotle's and Augustine's and through. It all comes from Aristotle and those philosophical pagan ideas that developed. And this, this is no, you can't go there. So he's <clears throat> passions. In other words, your your prayers, your tears can't move God. God doesn't respond to us. Immutable. This is the fact that God can't change. This is why God can't learn. God can't see, because everything comes out of Himself. See, and actually, God that God can't create. He certainly can't become a man. Immense, eternal, incomprehensible. Okay, I don't. You know, most of the stuff I don't agree with. I don't don't disagree with. Uh, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free. And not the God that decreed everything, because that's like God shot his wad, and that's it. God has decreed himself. God can't do anything new. That God, eternal works. That's the most odd things. Most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his immutable. Now let's see. God can't change his mind in response to human actions. He can't. He's immutable in all ways. See, it's just like uh, the idea of predestination. It's absolute in all. It, it, it's not just predestined some things. It predestined everything in exhaustive detail. Ah! That's Calvinism, real Calvinism, the Calvinism of the Westminster Confession, James White's Calvinism. Most Calvinists tend to ignore some of these things. Uh, it's immutable and most righteous will. Well, how is it righteous if he decrees sin? Most loving. What does it mean if he can't actually love anything but himself? That's true, too. I mean, you're non-existent. You only exist as part of his decree. God can't, because of his immutability. Now, see, that's why he has to be without passions. He can't, nothing outside of God. You know, this is the ideas of Aristotle's 
Aristotle's idea of perfection, if God is perfect, this is how God must be. In Aristotle's mind, that's all it is. It's not God revealing himself. So what, what do you want to do? Believe God or believe Aristotle? That's your choice. Uh, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering. No, he can't be moved to any of those things. So, yeah, you can fudge that stuff. That, well, God loves out of himself. God uh, acts out of himself. But the but the real God, the God that Calvinism describes is incapable of acting because that would involve changing changing his mind uh, as as we change as time changes as things move God's knowledge of what is must change right what is now because now is what exists so God the God of Calvinism can't really know that yesterday was yesterday and tomorrow's tomorrow and he can't know that this is March 8th 2023. Because God doesn't exist. He only exists in eternity. And he can't observe. He can't see what you're doing. Which might be good news for some people. He can only see what he decreed you to do. Before you were even in existence. This is all contradictory. To call him most loving. What does love mean then? Gracious, merciful. What does that mean? Long suffering, abundant in see this he's take they're they're mixing the Bible together with paganism, goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Why would he forgive what he decreed? And rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So they throw a lot of Bible stuff in there, but then they mix it with their own paganism. And withal, most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and and who will by no means clear the guilty. True, but not true enough, because it only, and this is uh, scripture references that are supposed to prove it. A lot of this is just quotes, but it's partial quotes out of context, out of the context of, of salvation. So let's go down to the eternal decree. That's chapter 3. click in the right window here. God from all eternity did. Now this is about as official Calvinism as you can get, get the most official source. Calvin himself is just one man. This is official later Calvinism as it had developed. It's even later than the three forms of unity. So this is uh, English Calvinism under the period of time of the uh, uh, when Calvinism came to power in England under Cromwell and the uh, the House of Commons, which couldn't keep their power very long. Uh, and this was discarded when they brought the king back. I mean, the son of the king. They chopped the king's head off. Then they brought his son back. That was a dangerous idea, as they found out. God, from all eternity, did... Say, this is before anything. By the most wise and holy counsel of his own uh, will freely and unchangeably ordain whatever comes to pass. There is no interaction between God and creation. Can't be. Freely and unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass. That's the, the eternal decree, uh, exhaustive eternal decree. In all details. Yet, now they have to put a caveat in here to try to cover their backside. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin. Pray tell, how is that? He eternally decreed it. If you check uh, with Calvin, he tries to do this dance. And theologians try to do this dance. Well, because God does not actually cause it directly. He doesn't force you to do it, but he, he puts the desire to do it in you. That is actually more of a direct cause than actually forcing your hand to do it. God doesn't grab your hand, stick a knife in it, and force you to stab someone. No, 
He puts the desire and the will and the ability to do it in your heart. Which is worse? The second's worse. See, when people call it, talk it, call it divine rape, no, it's far worse than rape because he changes your will to do the evil or, or decreed your will to do the evil. So you could do no other. See, you have no... There, there's no way God can judge if this is what God does because the defense would be, I only did what you decreed. If I'm guilty, you are too, God. You can't avoid that. In fact, since I was was irresistibly decreed, I'm not guilty at all. God's the guilty party. Alone. So why did he have to send his son to save sinners that he decreed to be sinners? One must ask. Yeah, so there, neither is God the author of sin. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, see, they're trying to cover their backside, but they fail. Neither is violence offered to the will of the creatures. Well, see, what they're saying here is, is because God put the desire to do it uh, and the will to do it in you, he didn't actually violate your will because he shaped your will. <laughs> wow, these people were... You know, this, these are like the kind of villains, uh, lawyer villains that defend the truly guilty and wicked people. Uh, that, that's what they are. That, this is slander against God, just outright slander. Uh, because of... Uh, see, this is like a reprobate mind here. This is, if you can say that God can ordain whatsoever comes to pass and then say that God is not the author of sin, oh, you're twisted. And doesn't offer, doesn't invite, yeah, but the reason it doesn't, because he creates the will. He de decreed the will to do it. So murderers murder because God decreed them to do so, willingly. It's not like he forces them, he decrees them to do it. <laughs> they could do none other. Of course they desired to do it, because he made them desire to do it. See, it, until, once you understand this, Calvinism goes out the door. Uh, neither is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather establishes. So God causes the second causes. It's all decreed. And nothing can happen other than that. And God is decreed it immutably, unchangeably. And God doesn't care anyway, because he has no passions. You can't be influenced. You cannot complain to God. He doesn't care. He doesn't listen. He has no ears, because he can't learn. He knows everything out of his eternal decree. Although God knows whatsoever may or can come to pass under all supposed conditions, that means absolutely nothing. Because if God decreed all things exhaustively, then there is no supposed conditions. <laughs> nothing is conditional. Yet hath he not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future or that it would come to pass upon such conditions. In other words, it's only because of his decree. There is no secondary cause. God is the cause. That's what it comes down to. By the decree of God for the manifestation of his own glory. There goes that Calvinist poison. God does everything for his own glory. Glory, glory. Really. That's not what Jesus said. God so loved the world that he gave his son. He didn't say God did it for his glory. For God's own glory, God sent his son. No, he didn't. He, for the, out of love, for creation, cosmos, his creation, his, his adornment. Creation is God's adornment. The devil came around and ruined God's adornment. <sighs> By the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, they're all about glory. That, this is called, psychologically, this is called projection. For, uh, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. It has nothing to do with whether, whether they want this or not, whether they would if they actually had a choice. 
No, they have no choice. They're made evil or they're made uh, onto everlasting life because if God made them, there, there's no, it, no more than a machine. I mean, a, a bulldozer doesn't have a choice that it's a bulldozer. See, there, and, and God couldn't, God is not a living God anyway. There was the eternal decree. That's it. Nothing else. God can't do anything after that. There's a logic to this, but it is twisted, and it is of Satan, satanic wisdom. Uh, those of mankind who are predestined unto life, God, before the foundation of the, of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and the good pleasure of his will. Well, if it was a secret counsel, how do they know what it was? Hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory, out of his mere free grace and love. Love as what? Without any foresight of faith or good works. See, this is eternal election. I don't think the Bible teaches eternal election of individuals. It teaches the eternal election of Christ. Christ was cho is the chosen one, and whether or not we're in Christ determines whether we're or not we are elect. You have to abide in Christ, too. Abide in faith in Christ. If you reject Christ, as Jesus said, he rejects you. <laughs> this is not a, a sin. This is rejecting, you know, becoming a Muslim or something like that. Disowning him, uh, divorcing him, that kind of thing. So what they're saying here is, is God elected some to life and some to damnation uh, simply because he chose to do it. Now, where does the Bible say this? It does not say this. If you look up their proof text, they do this. Yeah, I mean, you can find this on the Internet freely. Go to it. Look at these texts that are supposed to prove these clauses. This is a biblical proof, so-called, and see if they're actually teaching what the Calvinists say. For God has appointed the elect unto glory, uh, so hath he by eternal and the most free purpose of his will, but he's not free to change his will. Now, gods they can throw these words. They're like a politician talking about liberty and prosperity and justice. They're just throwing words out that they don't understand. Foreordained all the means they're on to. Well, the, the means is election. That is the real cause of salvation in Calvinism. The rest is just kabuki theater. The cross really has no purpose in Calvinism. It, it doesn't demonstrate, see, because it's, uh, salvation in Calvinism is not based on God's love for his creation. Fallen, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. See, the scripture is very clear. It's God's love is the root cause of our salvation. Not election, not eternal decree. See, all this happened before anything existed. It's all just in God's decree. Therefore, they who are elect, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ because of his decree, are effectually called onto faith in Christ by his Spirit. It's all kabuki theater. Sin is kabuki theater. I mean, it's all just nonsense. It's not, there's no reality to it. It's, it's God playing with his toys. Like little boys play with their toy soldiers. Well, they used to do this. And kill some of them off, and other ones, uh, you're the good guys, you're the bad guys. 
until I change sides and then drop a big dirt ball bomb on you and wipe you all out. I'm speaking with authority. <laughs> Boys do that. At least I did. That's why, you know, you, you get these little plastic figurines and you play war with them. But yet you're God. <laughs> Boom, you're God because I chose to end you. And then I'll put you back in the box and take you out next week. Uh, <clears throat> called effectually, yeah, you have to know the Calvinist language to know what they're talking about, but it, none of it makes sense. Uh, by faith in Christ, by his spirit working in due season, uh, are justified, adopted, sanctified, are kept by his power through faith unto salvation. It's all just pre-programmed in the, in the decree. You could do none other. Neither are any redeemed by Christ effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, or saved, but the elect only. See, that's why James White was insisting that election is the gospel. The God of Calvinism is not the God of the Bible. The rest of mankind, God was pleased, according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will. This is slander whereby he extended or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth for the glory of his sovereign power. Well, God is free to, to, to give mercy as he pleases because mercy is not required. I mean, God does not have to. Mercy is something somebody doesn't deserve. It's grace. Grace is not deserved. The person extending grace is free to extend it or not to extend it. There's no just requirement there. Oh, I can't go farther down than that. I guess I have to. Can I? How can I get myself out of there? Oh, here. Nope. Let me get. Okay, I want myself out of the picture. Okay, so. The rest of mankind he was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth. No! What does the scripture say? God is pleased to give mercy and grace to those who believe. It's on the basis of faith. For the glory of his sovereign, it's not for his glory, it's out of his love. God doesn't get anything from it. To pass by and ordain them to dishonor and wrath. Well, you're not passing them by because they don't even exist. He, he decreed not to choose them. And they go to hell because he decreed them to go to hell. To the, uh, uh, to the praise of his glorious justice. Well, it's not justice because they have no moral culpability. They didn't have a choice. It dishonors God's justice because the only reason they sinned was God decreed them to sin. Can you see that? If you can't, you need to become like a little child. <laughs> That's not fair. Of course it's not fair. Now, if we are actually responsible for our own sin, yes, God did shut us up under sin. That he might have mercy on all. That he might have mercy on all. God shut all up under sin, that he might have mercy on all. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. So what separates the saved from the sinners? He that believeth. Those who are believing in him, that salvation might be on the basis of grace through faith and not of works. That's what God ordained, that salvation would be by his grace through faith in him, through faith in Christ. God's works, not man's works, lest the sinners boast, because they truly are guilty. They are truly rebels. They need to surrender. <sighs> okay, so that so now we've looked at the Westminster Confession of Faith briefly. That's Calvinism. 
So why is James White complaining about God's decree? James White, you're just like those, those ungrateful Israelites in the desert whining about their manna. You're not satisfied with God's just decree. Are you? You're a rebel against God's decree. Uh, see, see, can you see the inconsistency here? How can you be a Calvinist that decrees God has decreed all things exhaustively for his own glory and then complain about what God has done? Because none of this could happen apart from God's decree. None of the pornography, none of the, the vice, none of the homosexuality, the transgenderism, none of the greed on Wall Street, none of the violence and murder that takes place in war, uh, nothing. Why do you complain about Washington? They're only doing what God decreed. And don't talk about the devil because he's just God's puppet. Biden's God's puppet. Abortion is utterly the will of God. Why are you fighting against it? Be consistent, man. That's what I say to atheists. If you're going to be an atheist, be consistent. Be a true atheist. Don't borrow from Christianity. Don't talk about love. Don't talk about justice. Don't talk about truth, because you have no basis for any of that. Be consistent. Be hopeless. Realize that you have no value. Live with the consequences of your atheism. That's called existentialism. Yeah, even even though it's irrational and illogical and it'd be better to commit suicide, no, don't do that. Just go on and suffer for no reason. Oh well. Well, when you get when you start confront when an atheist begins to confront the reality of his situation, then he might think there must be something better because he was not created to be an atheist. Atheist is being an atheist is sinful because he knows God exists. See, there's a, there's always going to be that inconsistency. He knows God exists. He's just fighting against that knowledge. Forty years, and it's really easy to focus upon the individuals who do this, the, the, the perverts themselves. But there's many other people in that video. There was a horrific one yesterday. Of okay, I have to do this. This is not scripted. It's just what comes to my mind. Uh, James White, here. He, now, he's complaining about the drag queen perverts that are putting on baby shows. This is apparently the... It's like, how can we top our abomination? It's, it's almost like they're trying to prove that there is no God because... God doesn't destroy them with a flash of lightning or something, which he certainly could do. But the fact is that all have sinned and fallen short of the uh, glory of God. See, they're sinners, but so is everybody else. And in God's just, how, how can you say, well, that sin deserves X, Y, and Z, but this sin is okay. So slandering God is worse than or better than whatever. So here, so under the eternal decree, James White is doing his video and saying what he's saying because God, God decreed it. And the cross-dressing baby show drag queens who are exposing their genitals to three-year-olds, are doing what they do for exactly the same reason. They're both doing the will of the God of Calvin. I have to not just say, I have to add the of Calvin there, or actually it's more Aristotle. I mean, James, can't you see that's logical? I'm trying to confront James White with the impossibility of his position. The inconsistency. He loves consistency. He's being utterly inconsistent. 
And theonomy is utterly inconsistent with all this. I mean, Christianity is inconsistent with Calvinism because it doesn't make any sense. Why did God bother to send his son to die on a cross? It's just kabuki theater. It's just shadow puppets. The eternal decree is the cause of everything in exhaustive detail. That exhaustive detail is the main problem with it. Uh, a little girl, probably three, um, doing, you know, imitating the adults, being given money, and twerking around, and a three-year-old being sexualized. It's just, it's perverse. It's 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 evil on a level that's really really difficult to understand. But it is the decreed will of your God, James. Is it not? Are you going, are you willing, James White, are you willing to deny that God decreed what you're complaining about? You whiner, you. You ingrate, you. God did it for his own glory. What are you whining about? See, Calvin is fine as long as it's sit in a theology book. But when you actually try to apply it to the real world, it breaks down. It breaks down. And you put it to the test, okay? Here's a situation. This is the world. This is what's really going on. And it is absurd. I mean, it, it is nuts. Well, okay, let, let me talk about something else here. Should I just leave James White on the screen? Because he has become a post-millennialist. And a preterist. In other words, he believes all the prophecies, or most of the prophecies, were fulfilled in 70 AD in the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. Strange that the first and second century church didn't know that. You look at the second century writings, say, of Irenaeus and others, uh, Justin Martyr. Uh, we have some fairly extensive writings. They, they didn't seem to say that uh, all the prophecies were fulfilled in that and Christ came back. They didn't seem to know about that. <laughs> You'd think they would have known if Christ had returned and if all the prophecies were fulfilled. No, in fact, Irenaeus and Justin Martyr uh, both hold to a future millennium. James White doesn't believe in that. See, I, I can't imagine how can you live as James White because he's got no hope. He's a, a post-millennialist. In other words, the church has to bring the millennium to pass and once all the world is under the submission to the law of God, then Christ can come back. Only then. They have to do the work, and then Christ can come. And he's, he's basically said, basically, that the reason he adopted post-millennialism, because he, he thinks that the other views, amillennialism, and there's no millennium, or the millennium is now, that comes from Augustine. And the kind of premillennialism he's aware of, uh, fundamentalist premillennialism, Darbyism, uh, dispensationalism, uh, he, there's no hope. He, he complains because it's, it's a hopeless thing because people are waiting around. Rather than people being out there doing, changing the world through the law, people are waiting for Christ to return. The, the blessed hope, you know, that... Because, but, I mean, you look at the world. Here's an example right here. He's talking about this, this drag queen kitty porn where they're corrupting infants publicly with approval from society. Well, some society. Now, he also says this is, this is happening all over the place. Everybody's doing this. No, not everybody. <laughs> now, there's maybe in certain, maybe in Phoenix, Arizona, but no, no, there are resistors that aren't even born-again Christians to some of this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> there are still... <laughs> huh. Anyway, a lot of people, they're just afraid to say this is wrong. 
uh, because of fear. But no, there's, there's, and there's people like me that say, it's wrong. I don't care what they say. But James White here, this, this, this inconsistency, I mean, he is, he's a bundle of inconsistencies. Theonomy is inconsistent with Calvinism. Postmillennialism is inconsistent with Calvinism. It's all inconsistent. His God is not consistent with the Bible. That's the problem. The God of the Bible is not the God of Calvinism. So until James White realizes that and returns more fully to the God of the Bible, so he's already got this conflict with, with uh, uh, Reformed Baptists that have decided they'd rather follow Thomas and Christ, uh, they see that the Thomas's, Thomas Aquinas' ideas come from a uh, Augustine and Aristotle. It's the same line of thought, classical Christian theism, it's called. Uh, trying to blend. See, Thomas's purpose was to harmonize pagan philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, those kind of guys, with the scripture, which is a wicked thing to try to do because the scripture very clearly says that the, the, uh, the world, through its wisdom, that's philosophy, philosophia is the love of wisdom, did not come to know God. In God's wisdom, they did not come to know God through their wisdom. So Thomas didn't believe the Bible anyway, and he decided, well, I like the philosophers. The church likes the philosophers. Let me do this project to reconcile the, philosoph the Bible to the philosophers. It's really what he tried to do. If you want to follow Thomas, you're trying, you're engaging in a gross sin against God. But so, and even James White has been unable to go with the Thomistic Baptists that used to be called Reformed Baptists on this. But the core of the the problem is the Calvinist idea of God, because it's been contaminated with paganism. Not all of it. But some key, uh, Satan injected a toxin into it. False ideas about God. He's a slanderer. Satan slanders God. And so does Calvinism. There's no way around that. And James White will do all kinds of ways to avoid that discussion. Because he's a debater. Deb debates are about winning the argument, not the truth. If James White truly loved the truth, he would abandon Calvinism. I mean, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's not consistent with the Bible. I mean, it can carry you away for a while, but if you know what the Bible, you can keep running into all these things that just don't fit. And eventually, the, the weight of the biblical testimony will top the dam, the dam of your willful ignorance and flood over you. It hasn't happened right yet. Now, even, no matter how much James does, tries to make himself look like Calvin, he's getting pretty close now. That's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. Well, I've talked long enough, but I, I did think it was necessary to point out the inconsistency, and obviously God decreed that I would go on a rabbit trail and bring up Calvinism and its slander uh, and uh, the fact that it worships a false god, is, uh, false ideas of God, not entirely false, but in important areas. Uh, God decreed that would happen for his own glory. Well, until next time, who knows what that will be on. God bless you. Have a good day. Love the truth, love God, and hold fast to Jesus Christ.